Welcome to Malcolm Reed's How to Barbecue Right, a podcast where we talk about barbecue, share recipes, and discuss all things delicious. And now, here's your host, Malcolm and Rochelle Reed. Hey, welcome back to the How to Barbecue Right podcast. I'm your host, Malcolm Reed, and joined by my lovely, talented wife, Miss Southern Shell, fresh off vacation. Mm-hmm. I guess you, this is our mid season break. Yeah, we took like, what, two weeks off? I think I was like off for five, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Were you, have you been back on a podcast yet, Tyler? I think you yeah, have. I think, I think I you came back right before we went on our break. It, the break snuck up on us because we were. I would come into work. I guess it's been two weeks ago, and I was like, "We're doing a podcast this morning." And Chill got to look at the calendar, so we're supposed to be off this week and like the next week. And so it was like I don't know if it was two or three weeks we were off, but we were scheduled, so we took it. We didn't even tell y'all. <laughs> it's like, oh, we're gone. Everybody in the community was like freaking out. Like, wait, why, where are they? <laughs> There's been so much going on. I mean, you know, it's all it's summertime, so summertime you get completely off schedule. Yes, you got kids staying up to all hours of the night, <laughs> wanting to sleep all day, and we've got trips planned that we, you know, we had a fishing trip yeah. that we went on, and it's just trying to get the smokehouse up and going and making yeah. some. We've made started making content down there. It's not. Would you say it's completely finished, but it's not completely decorated to Shell's approval? Yes. <laughs> right. We're, I'm working on it. Working well, on and, it. We, and we're still fighting, figuring out our lighting and sound. Yeah, our sound. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's been the bad. biggest challenge kind of so far is like we're not sound experts. We're not camera experts either. We just learn as we go. Yeah. So we've been experimenting, and we're trying to get the same. I mean, I think video quality sound is important. So we always want, you know, you want the best quality possible. We still want it to have our feel. So we're not like trying to overproduce it or anything. Yeah. But so far it's working good. I mean, the sound's a little echoey, but it's because we don't have it full of stuff yet. Yeah, I got some curtains and some I, things, and I need a rug. I need I to tie the room together, Shell. You know, rooms <laughs> tie the room together. I got a rug. So I think once we get all that stuff on there, it'll be fine. Yeah, I'm hoping a little more stuff on the walls. Real quick, I wanted to talk about our Palmer home. Yes. Uh, the feed a family campaign. The feed a family campaigns in full swing. And they did, they actually did, while we were gone on vacation, I jumped on there for a quick segment while we were down at the coast, but Super Talk Mississippi always does a live fundraiser for, and I got to promo the Palmer Home Feed a Family campaign on that Radiothon, so that was cool. But we're everybody knows we do it every, this is the third year we've done it. We, uh, we raise money for the Palmer Home to feed one or two of their families, hopefully, which is a house for of eight kids year. and two parents for an entire year. And uh, we've been, you know, done really well in the past, and it's all because um, our followers and y'all, y'all support us. And that's what's great about it. I mean, I've got to give a shout out to Luke Trees, man. <laughs> he is killing it because. So we met Luke. Did Luke come to the? Did yeah. he was the very? He's been with us since the very first Palmer Home event. Yeah. And he really takes the fundraising aspect of it, which is great. That's what you want people to do. Is like he's. So what he's doing is like selling different uh, barbecue dishes. Throughout the summer, and he, I guess he has, you know, the grills he has. He knows how many he can cook. He'll pre-sell them, cook them for people. He says he enjoys, he does it because, he, you know, he wants to help Palmer home. Yeah. But he does enjoys cooking, and it's a great way for him to share his stuff that he's cooking with his yeah. with his community. And, man, it's he's doing a fantastic job. And other people are, too. I mean, it's 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 really good. So, um, so uh, what are we giving away? We're giving away a cooking experience on an outlaw pit. How to learn with a- me and the crew, how to learn how to run one of these stick burners that y'all see us cooking on these outlaws. And the winner gets to take that outlaw patio home with them. Brand new. When they leave. And yeah. So, so are you going to teach them how to cook on that particular? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's going to be like we'll have one so they don't have to get theirs dirty. I yeah, mean, if they want to, I was- we can cook on that one, I guess. <laughs> but uh, but I was thinking that we'll have, I mean, we have, we keep those at the shop because we sell them here in the shop. But um, I was thinking they would just bring a trailer and load that dude up and take it home, and we can cook on one of ours or whatever. You know, we can cook on whatever it. They, they want, want, they want to get it seasoned yeah. by by us. We can do it. And uh, we also are giving away some prize packs for uh, number two and number three. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be some different yeah, stuff. Yeah, the grand the prize. Stuff. That's the grand prize. Outlaw, that, yeah. So whoever outlaw raises patio the most, smoker. Whoever raises the most money is going to get to come and spend that day with us, and it's going to be fun. I mean, we're going to do some cooking, but you know, we're probably going to go to La Siesta. We might, you know, I thought about this. I think it would be really cool to whoever does it comes and stays at the smokehouse. You know, I don't know. We hadn't worked out the details of we're doing it at the shop, doing it at the smokehouse, whatever. 
I just think it would be cool to do it at the Smokehouse so somebody could experience it. If you would like more information or to sign up to be a fundraiser, it's howtobarbecuewrite.com forward slash Palmer, P-A-L-M-E-R. That's right. Um, so we went fishing. So we did. So every, I guess, what have we been doing this the past I two or three years? Fishing. You, yeah, you won't fishing. get on the boat, will you? <laughs> no. They have, it's the, uh, it's the JCs of Mobile put on, it's probably the world's largest youth fishing rodeo, but they have, I think it's the world's largest deep sea fishing rodeo the following weekend. We go down for the kids rodeo because the kids love fishing in it. And, and it's fun. Yeah, and it's fun. So we had. Could guess, you even really compete with the professional? I don't know. I couldn't. <laughs> I mean, I guess you go out there and catch. See, you can because yeah. you never know. That's the great thing about fishing in the ocean. You don't know what you're going to catch. Yeah. You can go out there and wet a line, and you may pull up, you know, the biggest monster you've ever seen. You may not catch anything. But we have a good time. The kids had a great time. They caught a monster red snapper. It was like almost 23.96 pounds, which is huge. Um, we caught a limit of snapper. We caught some bee liners, which is a, another species of snapper called a vermilion snapper, and we uh, won second place with that, first place with the red snapper. Um, and the kid, I mean, the kids did it. Like we would, we were there to kind of help, but we the, when it just come to fighting the fish and doing everything, the kids did it, so it was pretty cool. And they have, a, I mean, it's you're wore out. We show up at that boat at five thirty in the morning. Mm-hmm. It's still dark. We get on the boat. We go out. I think we went out as far as we went. Ended up going the furthest from shore was like almost forty miles. Wow. So that's a long way. Yeah. How long does it take you to get out forty miles? Well, you fi- you don't really realize you're going that yeah, far because yeah. you're stopping and fishing like. First thing we stopped at these big boats that are like anchored off of Mobile Bay, and there's usually a bunch of fish hanging out by them. But it was real choppy that day, so it was you would not you would have hated it. <laughs> You'd have hated it. But we stopped at those big boats, and you're out there rocking and trying to fish. Yeah. And then we didn't catch anything there, and we ended up moving around to some oil rigs, and you're just kind of working your way out. Then we get out to the bluer water, and that's where I guess the snapper grounds were. The, the is it more calm out there? It did calm down out there. I don't know why. The, I guess it's just because they'd had a bunch of storms here recently or something. But it was. Uh, but it wasn't. It wasn't that bad, that bad. I didn't get sick. One kid got sick on the whole boat, and I think we had what nine. No, we had eleven people with us. So it was a pretty good sized boat. But it wasn't that bad. When you ride back, that's the long ride back. Because when you start heading back, we trolled almost all the way in trying to get something to bite a trolling rig, and we just didn't ever get a bite. I mean, it wasn't the best best day of fishing. But we caught, I think we came back with eight, it might have been, I don't know how many snappers it was. It was more than eight, it might have been 18 snappers and I don't know how many vermilion snappers we caught. So it was a good day. It was a, it was a mess of fish. We ate fish for a week when we got home. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to talk uh, about, uh, which we've talked about this before because you went and got redfish at the, the beginning of the summer. Yeah. And we ate redfish for a week. Is it redfish or red That snapper? was redfish. Okay, yeah, that was That red was redfish, fish, yeah. Oh, okay. Which is different. It's more of a, they call it inshore, but I mean, you're right there on the, I mean, it's kind of brackish water, but you usually don't catch them out way offshore. They're, they're offshore a little bit, but that's more of an inshore fish, and it's a, it's a species of red drum, so but it's the, different than a snapper. Okay, but the meat is similar. Uh, I mean, it's white flesh fish, both okay. of them. I think redfish is way better than snapper to me. Okay. I love redfish. It was really It's probably, good. you know, of those type of fish, it's one of my favorites to eat. So we had snapper this time. Yeah. Okay. I get but this, this trip was snapper. And I have figured it out. You know, we've been going down there for years. And always, like, brought fish back, tried to put them in Ziplocs or vacuum seals or put them in water and freeze them. And they're just never as good to me. So my thing now was when I come back from the coast, I'm going to bring enough fish that I can eat that week. I'm going to keep it on ice as cold as I can, bring it back, try not to put it in any water, yeah. and then cook it throughout the week and just go in the refrigerator and keep it ice cold. And that's what we did, and it was just fresh I mean, until we got tired of eating it that week, and then that was it. But that's how I do it now. I don't want a freezer full because I end up with all these packages of fish that we never eat. And you eat. never cook because you turn your nose yeah. up at so it. So I'd rather give it away to people. Or just just keep what you know that you're going to take and cook for a week. Because when it's fresh, it is so good. And I cooked it all different kinds of ways. I mean, 
You even cooked one in the um, air fryer. Yeah. So how hey. did you, how'd you cook it in the air fryer? So air fryer, air fryer snapper is delicious. It is. It's really so good. I cooked, and it's easy. Uh, yeah. Man, all I did was hit it with some duck fat. So I take the fillet. Now, these are boneless, uh, not, uh, well, fillets, boneless fillets, but skinless fillets. Sometimes people do um, skin on the half shell, they call it. But I like them. If I'm going to cook them most of the time, I like them just off the half shell. And so I took regular fillets of snapper, a little bit of duck fat spray, seasoned them with some King Crawl, preheated my air fryer at 400 for like three minutes, got it good and hot. Take it out, take the basket out. And you can only cook like, Two fillets at a time. If they're big fillets, you can cut them in half, but you don't want to overcrowd the basket. Yeah. And I put them in there at 400. I set me a timer for like eight minutes, and then I check them. And I'm looking for like 135 internal. But when Do it starts to flake, uh, the first few times I did, but I got to where just I could tell, yeah, just down. to get my time yeah. down. But it was about, so I'd go eight minutes and look at them, and I wanted to get kind of crispy on top. And that's a great thing about the air fryer at 400 and the air fryer. It's moving enough air inside it that it gets the top kind of crispy. Yeah, especially the edges. Yeah, and the edges get crispy. But the inside is just soft, white, Oh, flaky. man, it's like you delicious yeah. fish. And you won't overcook it. Like, I think it took a total of 11 minutes. I'd go eight minutes, I'd pull it out, and I'd check it about a minute and a half. So it was a total of 11 minutes, and it was perfect. And I made up a little... Um, but like you didn't a, do anything else to it? No, okay. that was it. It was just when it, as soon as it comes out, I hit it with a little bit of uh, squeezed butter, uh, lemon, squeezed yeah. lemon right over yeah. the top of it. And I made a little pan sauce with, uh, it was kind of like a white wine cream lemon sauce. Super easy. I mean, I just, I take a little bit of shallot, saute it a little olive oil, then I'll add some white wine, reduce it down for like three minutes on high just till it goes by about half. And then I throw in some cream, uh, kind of turn it off, and then start putting in pats of butter. And just let those butters melt a pat at a time so it doesn't emulsify, so it kind of stays together yeah, and makes yeah. a little quick sauce. And then finish it off with some parsley and some fresh squeezed lemon. And it's super light, but it goes so good with like a grilled fish, like a grilled white flesh fish. And it's, that was what we served with it. But you could add all kinds of stuff to that. You oh, could man. add like crab or. Yeah, I've done shrimp. I've shrimp. done like, you know, like a, a, we used to do, it was like a, Crawfish cream sauce yeah. that was really good. I think you've snapper. got a recipe. With yeah, that. I have. I've done that. Light. It was either last year, or year before. That's a really good. It's a little thicker sauce. This one was more on a a buttery thinner. Yeah, and yeah. it wasn't as. I mean, trying to keep the calories down some, so it wasn't as bad for you as a big crawfish cream sauce. <laughs> yeah. But it was good. It was really good. We had something good down there, and at one of the fish at the restaurants, it was a pot. Uh, it was what they call it, snapper poncha train. And that what it was we had that was it was like a shrimp and crab sauce over a snapper fillet grilled that blackened that was really good. I think you had you had shrimp, but I, that's yeah, what I, yeah. me and Michael had. It was really good. You came off a fishing boat and went and had fish. You got to <laughs> when you're on the coast, man. I don't go down there to eat steak. You know? so, um, so I want to talk about snapper throats. <laughs> what a are- of, man, a lot of people sleep on the snapper throats or ditch chickens. Why do they call them ditch chicken? Because it kind of looks, looks like a bird. Yeah, it looks weird when you fry it up or cook it up. A lot of people grill them. I've grilled them before. I like them grilled better than fried. Than fried? Oh, yeah. see, I'm a fried. I like it fried. The one time you cooked them, you cooked it, I think it was on an old Weber at, yeah, at, at a, the condo at a fish we house. had. Yeah. yeah, it was just a fish camp house. But y'all just cooked them kind of like you would on a half shell and basted it with butter, the some kind time. of garlic, parsley yeah. butter the whole time. It doesn't look as good. It doesn't look as good. It looks like, like you're meat. cooking bats <laughs> or something. <laughs> so what is a snapper throat? So you take, there's a lot of meat in that, I mean, it's the throat of the fish. So right up under the gills, they take it and they cut it all the way up under the, to the chin. And then they cut it back down in front of, right in front of that gill plate. And it pulls out that bottom throat. If you think of like the brisket or something like that, that's kind of what it is. Yeah. A fish. Oh, it's a fish. And most of the time, you could, yeah, kind of. <laughs> it really is with the whole throat and everything, yeah. but there's a lot of meat. So there's some big bones in there, but they're almost like chicken bones almost. Yeah. It's not pin bones. Yeah. It's not like little pin bones. Good. You're not getting little tiny bones. It's just a few big bones that's in that area of the fish. And all that other meat is in there. And it's just flaky, white, really great tasting meat. And a lot of people throw it away. They don't. They yeah. don't take it because you cut the fillets off, and that's what most people get. Well, I don't know who figured out. I guess they've been cooking them forever down there. <laughs> but someone told me about it, and I was like, I got to try them. And then once I tried them, I was like, man, this is too good to throw away. And so I don't. We kept every throat off every fish. 
I think when I did a, I did a recipe with it for TikTok, we hadn't released it yet, but it'll, it's coming. Yeah, it'll and, be this um, week by the time I, this so, podcast out. I cooked yeah. different size ones. I cooked that big snapper throat. I mean, they were really, really good. Um, So you fried them. Yeah, this time I did. I have, like like you said, all, olive oil. You don't have to scale them that way. You just cook them skin down. The skin kind of protects it on the grill. Yeah. And then you just kind of take it off and flake the fish off the skin. Uh, that's a good way. Uh, it's the, olive oil and Cajun seasons, all you need, and baste it with butter and a little lemon juice and parsley. That's really good. Over, you know, you kind of do a two zone fire so you can move them as needed so they don't burn up. But to me, it's almost got a better flavor texture than the actual fillet itself. Oh, the meat does. It's yeah. a different texture, and it's it's, it's really like crab like. I know it is. Yeah, that's why I like it. It's because like, it's flaky like a crab. It's all, yeah, it's flaky like crab meat, and dip it in a good ramelade sauce. Ramelade. Remelade. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Ramelade. How do you, how do you say like Remelade. I say Remelade. Remelade. Yeah. yeah. Remelade. Can I just say, thank God we don't call brisket cow's throat. <laughs> yeah, cow's, cow's throat. <laughs> That's a good th- cow's throat out there. Yeah. Y'all, well, y'all get ready. The bri- I mean, so if a fish had a, so a fish don't have a neck. It just goes from lips to brisket. <laughs> 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 or the belly, I guess you would say. So. Or a snapper does. There is no other place on it. But if it had a brisket, that's where it would be. So is it? It's always... all throat, neck, fi- fish, neck, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> is it always snapper throats, or do they do I've it never with seen other them, fish? I've never seen anybody do another fish okay. like that. So when you um, it takes a pretty good sized fish, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can't be pulling it if off you do it over the brim. Yeah, yeah, you don't have much. <laughs> <laughs> so when you pull it off, you keep the fins on it. Yeah, the fins stay. The, the fins are like potato chips. When you, you were talking about salty sea, sea salt and <laughs> potato chips, they're crunchy. They're crispy. They're good. They're really good. Did you try one? Uh-huh. What'd you think? It's you, good. Yeah, I thought it was good. I, I mean, mean, the meat I, I'm, inside I'm, there is you know, so good. I'm from anyway. Country, I eat fish fins. <laughs> but so okay, but it looks. You, I mean, how did you fry them? All I did was so you got to get the scales off first when you're frying because the skin stays on it. Just like you would if you were scaling a brim or perch, you take a spoon and go against the scale, just go back up the fish from kind of the tail end up towards the head. Scales and just scale it all. Everywhere. Scales scales go everywhere. Get all the scales off. If you want to rinse them, you can. Usually I just try to get all the scales off. I flip it over. Before I scale it, you want it to kind of butterfly a little bit. So they have, it's almost like a wishbone and a chicken breast. You take your knife, and you're not trying to cut all the way through the fish. You're just trying to cut through that bone. And so once you take your knife and kind of pop it, make a little slit right in the middle, it'll lay flat. It'll kind of butterfly out, makes it easier to scale. And so once you do that, um, if there's anything on that underside that they missed when they cut the throat out, sometimes there's some little pieces of stuff you want to trim off, just clean it up. Sometimes there's a little membrane there. You can pull that off. Yeah. But you're just trying to expose that flesh. And so I only season. I don't season the the skin side. I don't know why. I just I just season the What's meat the side. Point? Yeah. yeah. But I hit it with some AP, a little King Crawl, let it set. Whatever you want. Kinda. Yeah, whatever you want to season it with. Just Cajun seasoning. You want a little salt and pepper for some savoriness. You can put what it black, whatever you want it on it. Uh, then I take a big meat bag or a Ziploc, big Ziploc bag, put me a couple pounds of like Louisiana fish breading in there. It doesn't matter whatever brand fish breading you like. Uh, the meat's already seasoned, so you really have to doctor that too much. And then just put a few of them in there at a time, close it up and toss it. You want to get the breading all over the fish. And when you pull it out, you kind of shake the excess and put it on a little platter and let it sit there and kind of air dry where you get your oil hot. Why do you let it air dry? Uh, just so it gets a better, crunchier texture. Like a lot of times if you go right in, it's still real moist. You drop it in. It just wants to stay soft. It doesn't. I like just to give mine a few minutes to sit there and air dry a little bit with the breading on it. So your breading and your seasoning is completely dry. Yeah, and it, it sticks on it. It sticks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really pretty dry. I wouldn't say it's completely, completely dry, but it's pretty dry. And that way you don't go to popping and doing all that crazy stuff and you drop it in the oil, bend too much moisture on it. And I, and I don't like to set it on something flat. I like to have it on that rack so it kind of breathes and air can get around it. Yeah. And then um, I had one of my Bayou Classic double basket fryers. Pulled the, fr- pulled the baskets out. These things are pretty big. I didn't want them to stick out of the basket and all that. So I just got that peanut oil 350 degrees, uh, started dropping them in four or five at a time, depending on how big they are. And they kind of sink down a little bit, but they automatically, you know, go to kind of suspend it in that hot oil. They just go to frying. Then you just use some long spatula uh, tongs and kind of flip them around a little bit. 
and you know just make sure they're cooked even. And it takes eight to ten minutes to fry. You can kind of tell when something, especially fish, or when it's deep frying, it'll slow down a little bit. It'll start floating to the top. That's how you know it's done. You just kind of make sure it's golden brown to your liking. Take it out, drain it on that wire rack again, and then it's ready to go. I, mean, I like it hot and fresh like that. If you want to squeeze a little lemon over it, you can. Hit it with a little fresh parsley. Serve it up with some remoulade. <laughs> <laughs> or a tartare. <laughs> or tartare sauce. No, I make, I make a, a blue plate, the best mayo in the world, remoulade. And it's, man, it's super easy. It's it's basically like a kicked up, it's a kicked up mayonnaise. Uh, There's sauce. <laughs> it's like an aioli. Yeah, thing, it's yeah. got. I put spicy brown mustard in it. You could use Dijon. Uh, put some horseradish in it. Put some hot sauce in it. Some fresh lemon juice. Season it with plenty you, of king craw. You like to little use dill, sweet, dill or sweet pickle juice. You I can like use either sweet, one. Yeah, to give it a little sweet touch. Yeah, because some people like put it. ketchup in it if yeah. you want to add ketchup. But it's really great on anything, any kind of fried seafood. You got to serve that remoulade yeah. with it, and I like the little touch the the horseradish the little spice and the little you know notes that the horseradish gives it and it goes with the you know the acidity of the lemon juice and all that it's you, good it's really good you put the to me you put the right amount of horseradish on it because i don't really like horseradish that much yeah. but a little bit Go, yeah a right. little bit just gives yeah. it the right touch i mean some people go a little too heavy and all you get is horseradish yeah and I'm not i just want the that, faint but, hint of it yeah and it gives it a little bit of spice it's not a remoulade shouldn't be like hot but it should have some seasoning to it. Yeah. So it's pretty much a Cajun tartar sauce. I mean, it's kind of <laughs> what it is. Yeah. I mean, but it's good, man, with that snapper throats. And you take those throats and you just kind of pick the meat off that bone and then dip it in that remoulade sauce. Man. I was just taking them and tearing them in, in, in half, basically. And yeah. then you just kind of scoop up that little. That's what, that's what I do. First thing, I break that fish in half where you got it split. And then there's kind of meat right there on both sides. And you just pull it all out and. Did you try it, Tyler? I did not try it. I'm, <laughs> the only, fish they don't look great. I'm like, the only Yankee there. I've ever met that doesn't like seafood. Like, <laughs> I'll eat it sometimes. Like I, li- it's weird. I like sushi, which that doesn't make any sense, right? But I don't know. I'm just really picky. But like he turned me on to like catfish po' boys and stuff like that that I didn't know. So I like to try things. I think that particular day I'd already topped out with whatever we were cooking. But. Yeah, and that's a. I mean, it's different. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say it's exotic. You, some people, I guess, the way the fins look and all that, it just looks weird. Oh, it it doesn't look like weird. any kind of fish you've ever ate. <laughs> when they're on the grill, when you were cooking them on the grill, it looked, it looked like, like that. I thought they different. looked like whole crabs. Yeah. Because the way those two fins stick out in front of it when you yeah. fry them and they're crunchy, it looks like those are the claws you've done fried and the body's back. It's a good Halloween but, dish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've also, ditch chickens, man. Ditch chickens. We've also had a... Um, a mess of tomatoes. Man, this is – so two of my favorite things about the summer. One we're going to talk – well, I'm just going to go ahead and say them. Tomatoes and corn. <laughs> we're going to talk about tomatoes first. <laughs> Vine ripe and homegrown tomatoes. So this is, is there man a difference? Mr. Austin up at where my mom and dad are in Chihuahua, oh. Tennessee. Is there a difference between homegrown and store-bought Oh, tomatoes? heck yeah. Night and day. You taste the sunshine. You taste the – Dirt that it grows in and a good tomato. It's got that super acidity to it. And I can just, it just tastes like summertime. You go get a regular tomato from the grocery store, and I guess they have to pull them so early to transport. They don't get yeah. ripened and as well. House usually. And they just don't have the flavor as a, I mean, and you only get these tomatoes a few weeks out of the year. It's not like it's a full blown, full summer thing. When they come in right after the 4th of July, like they're probably done now. Yeah. I mean, they might have some more on the vines, but the bulk of the tomato crop is done. But we got a couple flats of them. My mom and dad brought me, um, and we've been eating tomatoes like crazy. <laughs> we have a rule that you get, we have to eat at least one tomato a day, a day, a day. <laughs> between us. But does it get any better, or does it say summertime more than a BLT with a fresh, <laughs> homegrown tomato? It's really good. I mean, so you take, and I, I'm not, you know, some people do the Texas toast, and I've done it. It's a little too much bread. I want sunbeam bread. I want blue plate mayonnaise smeared on both sides thick. <laughs> Good blue plate mayonnaise. Then you I toast want the bread, right? You gotta toast the bread. Toast yeah. The bread. Not too dark. Like a medium <laughs> light toast. Light skin, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I've got to take TX and put all over that mayonnaise. I want that salt and pepper crusty. And then I go down with two of the big slices of tomatoes, 
put a little extra kosher salt on those, some crispy bacon, and I've been on a Smithfield kick here lately. I know Wright's is the one. Wright's is too thick for a BLT to me. Yeah, yeah, I like the Smithfield. Yeah. Like home style or whatever it's called, Smithfield, perfect bacon. I want just Put, the regular size. And, I, and Smithville don't pay us nothing. I've just been eating the crap out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I put that on there. And then I like shredded lettuce instead of a big leaf of lettuce. Yeah. I, I buy, We've been buying, or you can shred it yourself, but for BLTs, it's easy to buy that bag of shredded lettuce. Put that on top. Put that top top bread with the mayo on it and then and cut it triangles. I love triangles. <laughs> you can have the triangles. So good. Uh, I have been just doing white bread. Mayonnaise. Tomato. Tomato. Oh, tomato sandwich, Salt man. Salt pepper, yeah. If you can eat tomato sandwich at least one a day. That's why you got to go light bread. You eat so much bread in the summer eating BLTs and tomato sandwiches. You can't eat Texas toast all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other day we were filming Buck Junkies videos, and I found out Mark does not toast his bread for BLTs. What? He likes them soft? I, yeah, and I feel like it was just uh, it's just too smushy. Like, yeah. That's not, yeah, to it's, me. It's real runny. You yeah. know, a BLT's got a lot of juice. Yeah, it's it's really, juice. to me it's really BLTT because <laughs> it's got to be bacon less tomato toast. Yeah. Like, if you eat it on just white bread, it's a tomato sandwich. I don't care what you put on it. If it's white bread, mayo, tomato, then whatever else you put on, that's just a tomato sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> you got to toast the bread to have it a BLT. I feel like the toast helps soak, you know, yeah. absorb the yeah. Well, that's a. It's got to hold up. You got You have a limited time. You can eat a tomato sandwich on untoasted bread, <laughs> yeah. or it's gonna go to mush. Yeah. Uh, you got to get down on that sand on the, on the tomato sandwich. BLT, you can take your time and savor it because that toast is holding it up. But you're gonna end up with that sog fingerprints, and it's gonna turn like orange. Hamburger. Yeah, like Mama Burger. <laughs> it's gonna be all dripping out. That bread just can't hold it up. Or good. And I like super soft bread. Like, yeah, that's. I mean, that makes a difference too. Having fresh bread. Heck yeah, you've trained me that. We don't buy bread unless we push on it. <laughs> you got we to. Y'all don't touch yeah. it. We go down. It don't matter what brand. So weird. <laughs> I try all the brands and see which one's the softest, and that's the one we're going with that day. <laughs> People wonder why you're touching all the loaves. Huh? <laughs> Look like a freak <laughs> down there in the yeah, eye. Yeah, even just, hamburger buns or hot dog buns. You don't touch them before you buy them? Yeah, you've taught me I got to. <laughs> that's why I don't like click lists. They'll just put anything in your yeah. car. I think my wife does the opposite. She goes and buys the carbonate bread that you push down, and it has no resistance. Oh, man. <laughs> she looks for the darn ones. Yeah, she wants the hard bread? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, um, real quick, you always use Blue Plate on your BLTs? Oh, it's, it's, you've got to. Best mayo on the planet? Yeah. I mean, if you had something else, I guess you could make do. Like, could. I wouldn't put mustard on a BLT. <laughs> but... Blue plate is the official mayo of summer. Yeah, me. if you're making a blue, if yeah. you're making a BLT this weekend, gotta use it. Use blue plate. Try it. <laughs> yeah, put some TX on it. And see what you think. Heck yeah, TX is good for eggs, BLTs, anything you use salt pepper. You've also been doing caprese salads. So I do. Yeah, I mean that's part of our summertime too. It's a it's a quick side dish. But I've got a new one that I've been doing. It's a marinated tomato salad. It's really good. And it's it's not really caprese, but it's got the ingredients of a caprese salad. So what I do, oh, and these summertime tomatoes we get, I peel them. I got it from my granny, my mom. They've always peeled tomatoes. We don't eat the peelings. Store-bought tomatoes, you can eat the peelings. They're not near as thick. They're, you know, but but a good homegrown sun-ripened tomato that, that I was raised on always has a little thicker peel. So we use a paring knife and we peel the tomatoes and core them and then slice them about, I don't know, a little bit thicker than a quarter inch. I like a beefsteak tomato slice, you know. And so I take those and put them in a casserole dish. And then I whip Just up. Just kind of lay them out flat. Flat. Yeah. And nothing on them yet. And I take them and I, in a small bowl, I'll add um, some fresh shallot and a little bit of like a clove of minced garlic and then some fresh squeezed lemon juice. And some white wine vinegar, like a tablespoon of water. You don't want too much vinegar. And then I'll drizzle, start drizzling in olive oil and whipping it up, trying to get it to emulsify in. It makes a vinaigrette, basically. And I add chiffonades of basil in it. I usually take a pretty good bit of basil and chop it up really fine, chiffonade, and then split it. And some of it goes in my vinaigrette. And I season that up with some TX, some crack, you know, fresh cracked black pepper, coarse salt, stuff like that. And get that, get that tasting really good. So you're basically and, making like a basil vinaigrette? Basically, pretty much a lemon basil yeah. vinaigrette. And I put just a touch of honey in it just to give it a touch of sweetness. Oh, okay. And whisk that all up. I didn't up. know you were putting that in there. Yeah. And then it goes right on top. I spread it out across all the tomatoes 
and I let them sit there and marinate for on the counter. I don't put them in the refrigerator because the refrigerator will change your tomato texture. I leave them on the counter, and they need to sit there about two hours. But what I'll do is I'll take them, and about every 30 minutes I'll come and I'll gently flip each slice over to where they get marinated on all sides. And then when I get ready to serve it, I'll uh, get the tomatoes all straight in the casserole dish. I'll take uh, the bit, the block of the mozzarella cheese that's already sliced. It's like the fresh mozzarella. Yeah, the real mozzarella. Yeah, I forget yeah. what brand it is. But I I'll think take, it's Bella. It might be. There's something Bella. Yeah. Really good. But I'll take that. And, and then it's slice, pre-sliced. It's too. pre-sliced. And I'll slice those slices in half and just kind of dot each piece of tomato with some of that mozzarella cheese and then come back with a little more of that basil chiff- chiffonade just to go over the top. And then I buy this, um, I can't remember the brand of it, but it's a, balsamic vinaigrette glaze. It's a balsamic glaze. It's, it might be Marzetti. Same people that do the peppercini peppers. I think it is. But I'll take that and I'll just do a light drizzle, kind of like crisscross across the top of that. And man, when you eat that, it's a it's a heck of a salad or side dish to go with anything summertime. The one you did Saturday night, I wanted to take, I, I wanted to take a picture of it because it was beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful, yeah. You got the tomatoes and the green and the, the white The white cheese and the, and the little... Balsamic glaze? It was a Bertoli. Bertoli, Bertoli brand. brand. Okay. That's right. They sell it at Kroger. Walmart probably has it too. But it makes the freshest, like, little marinated tomato salad. It's really good. And you could do it with store-bought tomatoes, but it wouldn't be as good. You really don't. You make caprese salads, like, on the reg for a couple weeks. Well, I get through tomato season. And then yeah. you don't, yeah. We've also been doing um, chicken on the pellet grill a lot. So you got me hooked on that. It's my burn ass chicken that I always did on Weber, and you started doing it for like prepping for these vacations to have some yeah. dinner options when we go. You said, and you started doing it on the pellet grill. Tell me what you did. Like, tell everybody what you well, did. The first thing I did, the first time I did it, I put it in a store bought cilantro lime marinade because I was going for me- I was going to use it for tacos. Bought some boneless, skinless chicken thighs, dropped it in a uh, cilantro lime marinade, let it hang out for an hour. And then I just put it, put some gringo on it, put it on the pellet grill, 350-ish for 30, 45 minutes. Oh, really? That sounds awful light. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe an hour? I was letting I you tell know. this one. Yeah, usually it takes about an hour, and it's about three seventy five. I set the alarm and go out there and check, check it, it and yeah. flip it and check it. It don't get yeah. like the burn ass chicken. It doesn't like get you the don't get the char or the yeah. crispiness, but man, it's so good. And for cooking a lot of boneless skinless thighs, I love it. We've been using it for all kinds of stuff for yeah. wraps, tacos. I've been doing different flavors. Yep. We did an Italian one, and I used it in a um, penne pasta dish. Um, I will say this that I have learned. Once you pull it off the grill and let it set, you really it gets juicier and better if you just let it hang out. Yep. Don't touch it. Don't cut it. Don't do anything to it. Put a little foil on it loosely. Like thirty to forty minutes. Oh yeah. On the counter. Yeah. It's gonna and I mean, I've been using it for kind of a prep anyway, so it's fine if it gets a little cold. Yeah. No, I think it's great. If you're serving it for dinner, you can serve it right away. Yeah, you can serve it right away. But if you're using it to cut up and kind of meal prep, this is the way to go. And you can cook a load of it, like that big family pack of boneless, skinless thighs. Cook, I mean, once you, it, it it serves a lot. It serves a lot of people once you get it all cut up. Heck yeah, it's and several pounds. Once you put it in like a pasta dish and stuff, which I think it's better in stuff than breast. I do too. It doesn't get dry. It doesn't get dry. It's and more flavor. Nobody knows. And so a lot of people don't <laughs> like thighs. Like yeah. Tyler, when did you tell me that your wife won't eat? Dark Literally. meat chicken? Yep. She just says too gristly, too fatty. I just don't think she's ever had it prepared properly. Yeah. Personally, yeah. You got to do the boneless, skinless thighs for them, man. Because well, once you do them and cut them up, nobody, I guarantee you nobody knows what it is. It's perfect for tacos, casseroles. Wraps. Wraps. We've been doing them for wraps. Salads. Yeah. Fajitas. Uh, <laughs> just quesadillas. Grab, sometimes you just grab a few bites out of the fridge. I do. I do. <laughs> I mean, I eat it with some boiled eggs. Some chicken and boiled eggs. But you got good protein right there. It's not as good as your burnt ass chicken, but it's a good it, it, for fast and no no fuss no muss. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a good prep. Yeah. yeah, you like doing it. I mean, I would if I was going to do them all the time, I'd do them on the grill. But on the actual <clears> charcoal, yeah, yeah, just I like that flavor that charcoal yeah. gives it. 
It does. It gives it a better flavor, but you, you still get a little bit of the flavor yeah, on the no, pellet I mean, it gives it it gives it a lot some flavor. It's just not as good as a charred up chicken. I agree. But I can be a little lazy. Yeah. When it comes to grilling. <laughs> I that pellet grill is just too easy to pass up. So we have a new butcher shop in town. We do. It's called Primo's Butcher Shop, right? Or meat shop, meat market. Is that what the official name is? Do you know, Tyler? I saw we tagged It's them. Primo's. Yeah, it is Primo's, like the grill. Yeah. Or, no, like the hunting company. <laughs> or some of the restaurants in Jackson. <laughs> Non-affiliated, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> but we stopped in there Saturday. We were we were thinking about going and getting a steak dinner somewhere. And the more we talked about it, I was like, you know, it's not going to be as good as we can cook out I'm going to be grill. disappointed. Yeah. So I said, let's go to the new butcher shop. We hadn't been yet. Go in there and get us some ribeyes and, you know, see what they have. Check it out. And I was glad we did. There was, there was really good steaks. Heck yeah. Uh, it's really cool in there. It's like an old school butcher shop. Yeah. You stand in line. You go talk, talk to a butcher. Tell him what you want. And they get it out and cut it right there. Yeah. Because I like steaks in the case. It's like I said, I wanted two ribeye. But they had bone-in ribeyes. How do you want them? And, he said, and I said, uh, 16 ounce each. And he took that whole ribeye. Took it over there and cut it with a knife, put it on the saw, busted the bone, wrapped them up, and there you go. Yeah. I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> Cutting them for you. So we grilled a ribeye on Saturday night. Yeah, it was delicious. I don't know if it could have got any better. I'd put that up against anything. And it's simple. I mean, you know, ribeyes are not hard to cook. Yeah, you cooked a strip, too. Michael likes strip. He's got to, he's got on a kick where he don't want any fat on his beef or steak. So he <laughs> He's so a filet I, man, right? Yeah, yeah, really. He likes fillets, but I'm trying to get him to eat strips, just to eat something besides a fillet. And he, so cheaper? he likes a strip. I mean, it ain't cheaper. It's just, I think it tastes better to me. Yeah. It's I mean, got I like more fillets, beef. but fillets just, you know, they're okay. It's well, not my favorite cut. Why not? Because I like the fat. I like the char. You know, I like all that, the way the fat gets charred and it gives it more flavor and it's juicier. But I mean, I'll eat a fillet. It ain't like I'm going to kick it to the curb. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's your it's favorite just, cut? I mean, it'd have to be a ribeye. Yeah. When I go somewhere, that's usually what I order. It's very rare that I order a different steak. You mixed up a baked potato butter. So let's talk about the tater first. Okay. We bought, so not only did we get steaks and, you know, steaks from the butcher shop, they had some giant baked potatoes. We got some spinach and artichoke dip. You bought some chicken salad. We bought a few things just to try some stuff. But Shell has got, she's the only person I know that tempts baked potatoes. (laughs) (laughs) If you're not tipping baked potatoes, what are you doing? I don't. I you just, just throw your thermal pin in there. What are you looking for? Two of five to two. Perfect ten. baked potato. Yeah. And I'm not gonna lie. When you told me that, I was like, ah, I'm a little skeptical because you checked on there like 195. Said so now they still got longer. I said, you sure? And at that perfect, <laughs> at, when you got the 205, you said, oh, they're there. It was the perfect texture. The crust was perfect on the outside. You'd seasoned it up with a little yeah. olive oil and seasonings, and then the inside was pillowy soft and just hot and. Just Perfect baked potato. I know a lot of people wrap their baked potatoes in full. Don't, don't do that. I don't like to do that. We take ours, coat it in olive oil, and then season the outside really kind of heavily. Yeah. Salt, we'll take pepper, it. herbs, you know, all that stuff. And something I did new this time is normally I just put it on a sheet pan with full, put it in the oven. But this time I put it on one of those raised racks mm-hmm. so the potato doesn't, like, get a little scorchy on the on bottom. On the bottom side where it yeah. sits. Yeah. yeah. Do you rotate them or just leave them the same way the whole time? I mean, I used to rotate them, but now I don't have to because I'm putting rack. them on the raised rack. That's a little more air around it. Yep. I have set them like right on the cooking rack in the oven, yeah. but they drip down and get your oven messy. So over that raised rack. If you're rack, not going to season them, it's yeah. fine. But. but so we were saying, oh, we're going to have loaded baked potatoes. So I got to think, I want to make a potato butter. It's all the things that I'd want in my loaded baked potato in one. And I was like, I've never done it this way. We always just set out potato toppings, you yeah. know, get everything out of the food. Whatever, we got, whatever yeah. we got. So I took a bowl and got me a stick of room softened butter. And I added probably a half a cup of sour cream or a little more and then eyeballed it. Added some shredded cheese, added some chives to it, added a lot of black pepper and some salt. And that was that was all I put in this. Just seasoned it really good and stirred it up, stirred it up, stirred it up. All, you pretty much whipped it. We, it went whipped, and it turned into – it looked like a dip. Then I covered it up and put it in the refrigerator so it would come back together. And then you could take an ice cream scoop, and when you busted that potato open, it's hot and steamy, 
and get you a big ice cream scoop of that potato butter and put right on top, and it would just melt down, and you got to stir, and it makes the best baked, loaded baked potato that you've ever had. Are you going to start doing that from now on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's too easy. <laughs> And it beats dragging all that stuff out and have it all on the table or wherever you're, you know, eating dinner. Yeah, and then you got to mix it all up. That's right. In your potato. In your potato. Yeah, yeah, it's oozing everywhere. This was in one. All of a sudden, it's like you can't even tell there's cheese in it until you get to mixing it up, and then it's all cheesy and melty. And it's like, man, I owned us. You could sell this baked potato <laughs> butter. <laughs> one thing we didn't have was bacon. We'd used it all in the yeah. BLT. So I wasn't missing it because I knew I had that big steak. Yeah. That's and kinda, you did mushrooms. That's kind of like your uh, Don't Tell Your Doctor dip. The yeah, it, it really is. When a I was little. doing that, it reminded me of the Don't Tell Your Doctor slash crack dip or whatever, yeah. kind of. You could add a little ranch season into that. Some people call, uh, I've seen one where it's a baked potato dip, and it's all the stuff that goes in a baked potato, and you serve it with like ruffles. So that's the potato you're eating it with is why they call it baked potato dip. Similar to that, except I don't think it. Doesn't Does have, have butter. butter huh? yeah. I don't think so. But but the don't tell the doctor had the butter. Mm. Yeah. And so I mean I had more stuff in that too. But yeah, it, I think was, it was a ranch packet. Yeah. And some yeah. stuff. Yeah. But it's a that's along the lines of what I was thinking when I made it. I highly recommend trying baked potato butter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else you'd put it on, but um, the other day I saw Greg Rimpy. He was talking about tomahawk steaks and asking yeah. all his guests if they were a waste of money. Uh, what do you think? Are tomahawk tomahawk steaks waste money? Well, I'm gonna have to say yeah because you're paying for the bone. Yeah, <laughs> I mean they're charging you for it. It's not like they give it to you. Yeah. Do you need that big bone? No. Is it cool? Showstopper. I mean, it looks cool. Yeah. yeah. Is but, it fun? Yeah. Yeah, but is I mean, is it worth the money for one? Probably not. Are you Go gonna ahead, give me two ribeyes? Yeah. For what I pay for that, double stack them up, and I've got this monster steak. You know. <laughs> Most of the time, a tomahawk, I mean, it's not meant for one person. You're usually cooking one and sharing it with the table or something like that yeah. because they're super thick. You know, it's a lot of beef, so one person's not going to eat all that. So you cut it off that bone, and then you slice it up, and then everybody can eat it kind of family style. So they're okay like that. Like if you want to cook a big, it's almost like a roast on a bone. Yep. So They're so thick. And they are good. It's just had I rather have just a regular ribeye? Yeah. Me too. And I don't want a real thick ribeye. I want my ribeye to be an inch. Uh, I want an inch and a quarter to inch and a half. Yeah. That's you know, that sixteen ounce size, like state contest size. Yes. Is a good eating size ribeye. I just feel like once they get too thick, your crust and flavor to inside meat ratio. Yeah, the ratio is screwed. Yeah. <laughs> or skewed. I like that inch, inch and a half. Yeah, yeah. that's me too. I mean, I, I don't need a 24-ounce steak. <laughs> 16 to 18 is plenty big enough. See, for us, like, it's kind of my replacement prime rib for, like, during the year because we only really make prime rib for Christmas time. Yeah. Because it's just too much meat. It's too expensive to just buy on a normal weekday. So I'll buy the tomahawk and season it just like I would the prime rib and serve it with the horseradish and stuff like that. So I kind of get my fix. But, Yeah. Do you cook it like a prime rib, or do you, like, grill it, or, like, reverse sear it? Uh, I have cooked it like a prime rib. It's kind of harder because it's not as much meat. It's not as much volume, so I feel like it yeah. cooks a bit faster on the inside to get that <clears> same <throat> texture. But I'll get the sear on the uh, Weber yeah. and then put it on the pellet grill and stuff and okay. serve it with rosemary and that kind of stuff. I think the best one I've ever cooked has been on the drum, that smoked yeah. prime rib or smoked tomahawk. Yeah, I agree. I did one where I drilled a hole in it and hung it. It was, man, that joker was so good. And I've done it again where it was just – on the on the You've racks. done reverse yeah. sear. Yeah, I've done reverse sear. And yeah, a reverse reverse too. sear, whatever. But that hanging one where you just cook it the whole time at the same temp and don't sear it at all, just let it do its thing, it's probably the best tasting one. Well, you got those meat juices yeah. dripping on coals. Oh, yeah. Can't beat it. Um, I watched a TikTok the other day, and uh, this guy was talking about how you do, like, the ideal seasoning for steak. This is like Shell's learning time. Okay. I got a okay. Oh, yeah, I like Shell's Learning Time now. So I, I was looking into what he was talking about. He says he does not season. He says you can only season your steak three three different times. What? Three points. Okay. There's three points that is acceptable to season your steak. 40 minutes before you grill, right before it hits the grill, and when it comes off the grill. But if you season it any other time, you're screwing it up. So let me tell you the reasoning behind okay, this idea. Okay, let's hear it. I'm listening. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm open. Um, if you salt for less than 10 minutes, 
like if you put it on there and let it five minutes later, you're putting it on the grill. The process of osmosis causes salt to pull the juices out of the meat, but it doesn't have time for to allow them to reabsorb. So it causes the meat to lose the moisture, and it actually is gives you a more difficult time to get a crispy crust. Mm-hmm. So, but if you allow it to, if you put salt on the steak, let it sit for at least four mi- 40 minutes, all the meat juices will be expelled and then reabsorbed. You know, I've noticed that because when I do a steak, I always, I always been giving them an hour in contest. Yeah. We'll season it an hour before, then start working on getting our grill ready. And by the time we go, it's ready to go. But what I've done, and I notice it does it on whatever side is up, it doesn't pull as much moisture out as it does the side that's laying flat. Yeah. So I flip them because all that moisture is pulling out. And I'm thinking, hey, I'm kind of dry brine and marinated while it's sitting right here. And depending on temperature, sometimes I'll leave it on the counter if it's inside or if it's out, you know, if it's outside and we're in the elements, I'll keep it in a cooler to keep it from getting too warm because I don't want it too hot. I want it to cook at the right temp, the right rate. But if it's on the counter and your house is 70 degrees, you know, it's not yeah. going to warm up too much sitting there for an hour. And I want my steak room temperature yeah, when it yeah. I feel like it gets or more cl- I mean, cooked. If, if you guess, it's probably not room temp. It's probably more like 50 degrees, maybe. Yeah. It's probably, you know, it probably hadn't come all the way up to like 70 or whatever. You're not but, leaving it out that long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it says the salt dissolves into a brine that breaks down the muscle fibers and and then is reabsorbed into the meat. I agree with that. So what was the other one? So that was that's one time. Just before you grill, you can season your steak with salt right before you put it on the grill because the salt, the salt will stay on the surface of the meat without dissolving and the meat, meat juices stay within the muscle fibers. If you salt it right, right before, before, not 10 minutes before, right before, right before, like salt it, yeah. go on. And if you do it after, it's because, you know, well, I've seen you like, you're not doing anything then. Have you seen the TikTok where the guy's talking about he don't season the steak at all until it comes off and he seasons the board? Yeah. And work it. But I guess what he's doing is cutting it all up, seasoning his board and tossing everything in it. Um, most then of the time. He lets it rest. He calls it, he cuts it and lets it rest. Cut so, it. so all that juice runs out and it gives him some tossing juice? Yeah. So, and he says if you let it sit, it'll reabsorb the juice after it's yeah. cut. And that kind of goes against everything I've been taught. Well, yeah, because I don't want my steak set, somebody cutting it up, letting it sit there on a board and get cold. Yeah. When it comes to me, I want it to be hot and I want to be the person that cuts it up. He says you put it on a hot plate. Well, yeah. Oh, so that's <laughs> warm it back up on the hot plate. Maybe that's what they do. I, I don't know. I, want I don't know. I feel like if I've ordered this big rib at a restaurant, I want to be the man that cuts it up. I don't know if they take it. What are they doing? Are they giving me all my steak? Have they done shortchange me some back here? Is the, is the chef eating some of it? <laughs> you trust them to cut it up and bring it to you. There's some restaurants I want to where cut, they'll cut it table, the table side. Yeah. Yeah. I or, can handle my own. I know what I'm about. <laughs> I mean, You just give me a good night. Yeah. But I, I tell you what I do like to do, and we've been doing this for a while, is using a seasoned butter. Like make you a compound butter or buy you a herb and garlic season. They sell them yes, in the store Kelly, now. Uh, Carry Gold. Carry Gold had one. Yeah, yeah Car- it was it really was good. good. It was like chive and garlic, stick of butter. Yeah. And so I'll take two or three pats of that, put it on whatever uh, platter or pan that I'm taking my steaks up in. And as soon as they come off, I'll set those steaks on there. On top of on the top butter. of that butter. Not right on top of the steak. I have done it on top of the steak. But I like to set them right on top of it. Why? And mm-hmm. let them rest. Because as the juices from the steak are me- and it's melting that butter, all that flavor is getting on the bottom of that steak. And it's, I mean, I'm still pretty on the top side. And so then what I do, I'll take, as that butter melts off in the little sheet pan that I hold my steaks on, I'll take a brush and I'll brush up some of that excess and not brush the top of my steaks, but I'll just kind of drizzle it lightly over it. And so that way everybody's getting a perfectly buttered seasoned steak, or you're still getting some of that juice that's coming out of the steak on your steak. Then when you move it to a, a everybody's plate, like it was me, you, and Michael at dinner, mm-hmm. whatever excess juice is in that pan, I'll take it and serve it over that steak in the plate too so everybody gets some more of it. So you're still getting all that flavor, and it's like you're seasoning it again yeah. at the end. But I think it just makes a – Good sopping yeah, juice. Yeah, you don't need a sauce. But why don't you put the butter of, on top? Um, but when you do it, it just turns ugly. It, like yeah. you put a pat of butter up there, it changes the tel- color. I mean, it's fine if you want to move it out like that and spread it around. It just doesn't look as good to me. And I've done it. Some, I've done some videos where I put butter right on top. And if you look at those videos, 
that steak don't look as good to me as it does when it comes off the grill and it's sitting there cooling on its own and then the butter's underneath it and I can really just touch it up and make it glazed look. It has that gloss sheen to it. Without it running. Yeah, or, without it well, running. Yeah. Without it pulling the color That's out right. of the top. That's yeah. right. So get this. Uh, when I was doing this research, I saw, I saw that they said even perfectly pink steak will look gray or brown in the natural sunlight. And that's why steak houses don't have windows. So every time we've been filming outside and it's like, gosh, that steak. It looks- Perfectly cooked, but it looks over. <laughs> yeah. How many big- times have, we, have you done that to me? I was like, man, you screwed that one up. And I'd be like, <laughs> I know it's not. This thermometer's not lying. But it's the hues of the UV light, huh? Yeah. It'll polarize lens. But when you take it inside, oh yeah, it, it looks, looks perfect. perfect. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've noticed that We've a lot of that times. With, uh, Prime rib a lot. And on yeah. camera, you can't, like, it doesn't show, on camera, it shows the perfect color. Yeah. So when you go back and edit it, it's like, wow, that looks awesome. Mm-hmm. It's not doctored at all, but out there in natural light, I guess it's just playing tricks on you. Yeah. I thought that was kind of cool. I thought they was, you know, in case the steak business don't work out, they turn into a strip club or something. <laughs> <laughs> you don't ever say windows and strip clubs. <laughs> Not that you would know. Not that I would know. That's what I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told. Um, it's a fallback plan. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I mean, that's very interesting. That, you know, all these tips. years, all these years we've been fighting. We've been fighting the color. Out, nothing, but... Yeah. <laughs> Why does it look so? So we're going to test that theory inside the smokehouse. Okay. The next time we yeah. cook a steak. Yeah. We're going to slice one outside, natural light, and then one inside in. and yeah. see what they look like. That's good to know. So what you got coming up? Um, actually, we're headed to, this week, we're headed to Collinsville, Illinois, to the Code 3. It's uh, the Collins, Collinsville Main Street. Barbecue uh, Fest? Barbecue Fest. Look up the official name for it, please. Okay. But it is in downtown Collinsville on Main Street. It is a, it's a, Steak cook off, KCBS cook off. Um, they're smoking on Main. Smoking on Main. And we've been to it. It's been several years since we've been. My friends at Code 3 put it on. And I'm going up there doing a meet and greet on Saturday. Um, and the contest is raising money for their local food pantry. I think they're doing donations for the meet and greet thing. But they're also doing a uh, steak class. I think it's Marty Plume and Johnny Joseph's going to be doing a steak class. At Code 3 on Friday night. Um, you can probably find details about that on their website. I hadn't looked that up, but it's going to be a fun time. Uh, that's a huge contest. They got good bands. The town comes out. They shut down it's a all lot that. Of fun. Yeah, they shut down all that downtown area. There's a lot of food vendors, ton of contestants up there. And it's real close. It's like, what is it? Not even 20 minutes from St. Louis. Yeah. So that's kind of gives you the idea of where it is. But Collinsville is a neat little town. The last time we were there, People had their chairs sitting out on Main oh, yeah. Street in front of the big stage. Kids were running around playing. It was a it was a lot like great. a Galax or a Murfreesboro yeah. or something like that. Just a cool, cool, really uh, family friendly, community driven contest that everybody supports up there. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, next week I will be on Greg Rimpy. Um, I think I was I missed the past. I think I missed the past two months. I'm sorry, Greg. Oh really? Yeah, you well, were on in June. You just missed July because well, it was July fourth. Is that what it was? I think okay. so, yeah. Maybe so. I think I'm going to be on next week. I need to look. He told me. <laughs> it, it's supposed to be my regular spot. I may or may not. I need to double check that before I tell everybody. I'm sorry. It's on the calendar. Yeah. I got it on my calendar. I can't remember. Greg told me. It's been a month since I talked to him. But he told me he had another guest come up. So I, that might that might be bumped this month. I might have got bumped. <laughs> anyway. It's fine. Tune in to Greg's show, and if it's if I'm Whether not on there, there there's going to be a great guest on there. I promise you. <laughs> He's always got every Tuesday at the Barbecue Central show. Greg, Greg has some of the best guests in barbecue come on there. Um, tomorrow we're going to film a brisket. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm seasoning up. Uh, probably going to start tonight. Seasoning up my new outlaw that I've got out there in the smokehouse. Um, and we're going to do, I'm going to bring Mark in. He's going to hang out with me tomorrow. And we're going to talk about brisket. And we're going to Hey, Mark got cook first place one. brisket. He, he this went up to week. Galax. Shout out to the Team Outlaws. They come away with, uh, they want a bunch of fiddles and a guitar up in uh, Galax. Oh, they got a guitar too. Uh, one of the outlaw teams did. Yeah. I mean, they won't, I think, I mean, they finaled in Hog, Mark, Mark and Jamie and Swine Live, Jay Cook with them. They've 
Yeah. They got first place in the rib category in NBN. Uh, Mark got a 180. I don't know if it's a 180, but he got a first place brisket. Uh, and I think Outlaw yeah. got second place brisket up there. I mean, Outlaw showed out at Galax. That was they they had a great contest. That's always a fun one, you know. It's, it's a long way from for us to travel, but I mean, it's a good contest. If it was closer, you'd be there every year. I'd be you? there every year. Um, so Mark's been tearing it up, cooking brisket. Oh yeah, he's been he's had he ain't cooked many this year, but every time he does, he gets a call. Yeah, usually a first place yeah. call. Yeah. So are you going to try to get him to show you his tips? Or? Uh, no, we're not doing competition style. We're going to cook an eating brisket. Okay. But we're going to talk about some competition style cooking. I mean, it's different. You know, they're cooking for one bite brisket yeah. and jazzing it all up. If I'm cooking one at home in the smokehouse, it's because I want to eat brisket. Is it going to be low and slow, hot and fast? Um, It's going to be stick burner style. Stick burner is not, I mean. Is that a different It's style? just you cook it at three, 275, 300 the whole time. That's where that pit likes to run. I don't try to hold it down or hold it back. I mean, sometimes you start it out, put that brisket on there hot when it, when you first fire the pit, you know, get the pit going and then taper it back down because it'll make that brisket swell up and do some amazing things. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just let it hang out and finish and hold it. That's the whole secret to brisket. It's going to be a long cook. Um, we'll have to see how the filming goes. Yeah, we're going to start stay early. With me. Yeah, we got to get started. We need to get started before sunrise. Uh, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll we'll talk about. That. Well, you go down there and just have some beverages. Just stay, stay up, up all, all night. night. <laughs> That's what I'm getting at. <laughs> stay up all night. Just make a party out of it. Uh, we can't do that anymore. <laughs> Well, Mark, that's all I have for you. I may today. be at St. Louis at the ball game. Yeah, Thursday we are going. Night. To if anybody else is game. there, and y'all see us, say hello. Uh, they're playing the Cubbies. Yeah, that's gonna be a good game. I'm excited about that. Um, but, that's all I got for you this week, Mount. That's all we got, Tyler. What's going on in the community? We haven't even talked about any questions or comments and everything. Everything. Our people, uh, tell them we're back. <laughs> yeah, so we're back. Uh, if y'all are curious about our Facebook community, it's the Let's Get to Cooking community. You can go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash H2Q community to find us. And there's like tons of people on there that are like like minded pit masters, people that follow Malcolm, but also just people that love grilling. I did see, did y'all see that rotisserie brisket? Uh-uh. Somebody did a rotisserie brisket on. Like in a basket or how they no, do that? Like, like on a spit? On a spit. Wow. Wow. And they rotisserized a brisket. I thought that was pretty cool. I've never seen that. I know. Yeah. I think that'd be pretty good, the dripping over the coal. Yeah, so, you know oh, this, the flavor. The, uh, with that Primo grill they sent me, they sent me a rotisserie attach- attachment. I've been thinking about doing some roast beef on it. Ooh, like yeah. Like some deli meat like style a, roast beef on that grill. Would that be like that Baltimore pit beef? Uh, I've been wanting you to try that. Kind of, maybe, maybe. But I was thinking I was thinking more roast beef. I mean, there like, ain't much difference. <laughs> like what roast you would beef. make. Yeah, it. it's going to be kind of the same way. It's on a grill, but. Roast, a good roast beef. It's hard to find a good roast beef, but a good roast beef yeah. is like my favorite lunch meat. Oh yeah. Most of the time they're kind of bland and don't have enough salt in them. Or yeah, something. I don't know. Anyway, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> Just <laughs> make sure y'all head over there. And next week uh, we will feature some of y'all's questions. So make sure y'all uh, make some posts over there, share some recipes, and any contests coming up. Uh, I don't think we have one planned now, but we should have one yeah. super soon. Okay. Yeah, we Labor Day. We got to do a Labor Day one. You know, it's That's time to start planning fantasy football. Oh, yeah. It's time for football season's coming. That means wings, wings, wings. <laughs> There's all kinds of good stuff coming up. We'll come up with something. Favorite time say, of the year. I will say this. We did have some of the best chicken wings down on the beach. That you I've thought they were that. You thought they were time. the best. Yeah. What was that place called? Pirates. <laughs> yeah, Pirates Pizza, Pizza and, and Wings. wings. Yeah. Those wings were fire. They were just at the beach hungry that day. <laughs> maybe, maybe. That 80 thing. They were good, though. Shout out to Dolphin Island. If y'all never been there, don't go. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want everybody to find out about it. That. shouldn't shut up. To... We get that comment a lot. <laughs> yeah, but... don't go to Dolphin Island. It's horrible. <laughs> you won't have fun. You won't catch any fish. There's alligators on the beach. Alligators on the beach. <laughs> there really are. <laughs> like, for real. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't see one. Did you see one? I heard. Yeah. And I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, well, we appreciate y'all hanging out. It's good to be back. And we're going to come back next week and talk more things barbecue. Shell, tell them where they can find us. Oh, yeah. If you'd like to connect with Malcolm, it's How to BBQ Right on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and of course, YouTube. If you'd like to connect with me, it's Miss Southern Shell on Instagram. All right. We'll see y'all next week. We're gone. <laughs>